and welcome. In today's episode, we're going to be focusing on one of the most iconic buildings in London, St Paul's Cathedral. Now, when I'm filming this, we're currently unable to visit inside St Paul's Cathedral. So in part one, we're going to focus on the surprising and often overlooked history on the outside of the building and in the surrounding area. And we'll venture inside for part two. My name's Katie, I'm a qualified blue badge tourist guide and I run private tours inside St Paul's Cathedral as well as walking tours across London. So we should probably start with the fact that the St Paul's Cathedral that we see today was rebuilt after the Great Fire of London in 1666 and we'll be hearing more about that shortly. But there's been a site of Christian worship here since 604 AD. Now, many of the early churches were repeatedly burnt down or destroyed. And so the major church, when we talk about the old St Paul's, was started in 1087. It's also referred to as the medieval St Paul's. The old St Paul's was the largest public building in London, and it was surrounded by this network of narrow streets and shops. It would have really felt like this bustling community and sometimes it's quite hard to get a sense of that today but on the southeast corner of the churchyard you can find this plaque that remembers the old street old change and this can also be seen on the agus map of the late 16th century and then there's this street cannon alley which is my personal favourite view of St Paul's Cathedral. Now, although today it's full of modern buildings, when you approach St Paul's from this angle, you really get a sense of what it might have been like when approaching the old St Paul's Cathedral before the Great Fire. And another reminder of the kind of atmosphere of the old St Paul's can be found in the northeast corner of the churchyard. Look down and you'll see this plaque to St Paul's Cross. It was a public meeting place, an alfresco pulpit, and would draw crowds of thousands between when it was first mentioned in 1191 and then finally destroyed in 1643. It was also a place of execution, with the most grisly deaths reserved for traitors. One of the most famous executions to take place here was some of the people behind the gunpowder plot an attempt to blow up Parliament in 1606. On the subject of executions, one structure that often gets overlooked in the shadow of St Paul's is this stone gateway. This was built between 1669 and 1672 by Christopher Wren, the same architect as St Paul's Cathedral. It's Temple Bar, and it once marked the western edge of the City of London and stood on Fleet Street. By the late 1800s, it was a bit of a traffic bottleneck, and so after being demolished and a brief stint outside the city, that's a whole other story, perhaps something we can cover in a later video, it was returned to the City of London in 2004. Thankfully, one aspect didn't survive the move, Temple Bar was once famed for displaying criminals' heads on spikes, a kind of traditional London welcome, warning you to behave when entering the city. The last heads blew down in a storm in 1746. Walking through Temple Bar today, you enter Paternoster Square, which is modern but on the site of the ancient community of London booksellers. These were decimated in the Blitz, the worst night of which is sometimes referred to as the Second Great Fire of London. Thankfully, St Paul's Cathedral survived that fire, but it wasn't so lucky in the Great Fire of London of 1666. Now, the Great Fire is probably a topic for a whole other video, but here are some key pointers. The fire started in a bakery on the 2nd of September, 1666, on the east of the city of London, near to where Monument Tube Station is today. And the fire reached St Paul's on the third day. Now people thought surely this huge building that's made of stone would be safe. They were so confident that they stored their possessions, furniture and books in the crypt. 
but St Paul's at this point was in a state of disrepair. It was covered in wooden scaffolding and in reality it made the perfect bonfire. Londoners could only watch in horror as the lead turned molten and ran off the roof. It flowed glowing red into the streets and it must have seemed like the end of the world. However, out of these ashes comes the new St Paul's Cathedral designed by Christopher Wren and legend has it that Wren asked a small boy to go fetch a piece of masonry to be the foundation stone. Looking down, he smiled. It was a section of a tomb that read, Resurgum, I will rise again. And if you look up above the south transept, that word and a phoenix rising from the flames can be seen above you. But what about the rebuilding itself? Wren was a gifted mathematician and this would come in very handy for trying to work out just how the building wouldn't collapse under the huge mass of his great dome. We'll talk a little bit more about the construction of the dome and how much of a genius idea it is in part two, but a fact that always blows my mind is that the dome structure in its entirety weighs 65 thousand tons. That is more than the Titanic. Right from the start, the dome was an important symbol for London and the emergence of this new city from the ashes. It took until the 1960s for another building to overtake the height of St Paul's within central London. And even today, modern skyscrapers literally lean to one side in order to protect the view of that dome. A brilliant example is from Fleet Street where you can see the cheese grater on the left hand side making sure he doesn't interrupt good old Paul. By the time that the last stone was laid in the early 1700s the reigning monarch was Queen Anne and her statue can be seen in front of the main entrance of St Paul's Cathedral. This is a replica of the original and surrounding it are figures representing Britannia, France, Ireland and America. Now the indigenous American figure is worth a closer look. She's shown bare chested with a quiver of arrows and a lizard at her feet. And to hammer home this idea of otherness, there's also a severed head of a European. Skipping forward to 1897, we meet another monarch, this time Queen Victoria, and she's mentioned in this plaque at the base of the steps up to St Paul's. It commemorates her diamond jubilee, celebrating 60 years on the throne. And by this point, Victoria is in her late 70s. She arrives in her carriage, takes one look at those steps and thinks, not today. So amazingly, the ceremony takes place around her. She is the queen, after all. Just to the right of here, underneath the steps, you'll find an intriguing door that is probably the most curious part of St Paul's history. From 1890, this was the site of a small hospital. It was run by the St John's Ambulance Association and was essentially a tiny A&E department. It would have administered first aid and by the 1920s was treating tens of thousands of patients every year. I've linked to a great blog post about it in the description below. So I hope today you've learned about some of the quirkier details surrounding St Paul's Cathedral and I look forward to part two where I can take you inside this magnificent building. For now you might enjoy some more sneaky secrets on another London icon, Tower Bridge. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and I will see you next week for more of London's hidden history.